I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast, ROM. Today is part number eight wow. of our 10-part series. Did anyone ever think we'd get this far? Did anyone ever think that we would get this far when we started out the podcast? Not if they heard that first podcast. Man, that Ooh. was really bad. No, was unfortunately, bad. no one did other than us. That's, the two that's, of us. No one that's not even one that. of those cool lo-fi garage rock recordings that you hear and people decide are actually really cool and gritty. No, Rob, this was just... Rob, once we become like superstars, yes. are people going to be like auctioning off that recording? I think that'd be a good Patreon item. Put it up there, like give us 500 bucks for our second ever podcast now that we're being interviewed by Howard Stern and Jimmy Fallon and all kinds of famous people. Which we are just right around the just corner around from the corner. being interviewed by them. <laughs> it's just a question of weeks, I would say now. Um, today we're looking at the 1970s, which as we've emphasized several times is a doo-doo period for Chinese literature in mainland China, the PRC, right, but Rob? This is, yeah, but this is the cool decade. This is the hinge point. Right, so 1976, Mao dies, and the Cultural Revolution ends. We'll talk about the Cultural Revolution in just a second. Dun, dun, dun. And after that, things get super interesting. Huh. So, uh, you know, it's funny. We, this is actually a re-recorded podcast. In an earlier <laughs> version of this, your pick was a, a firm, uh, a, one of the only really works of, of art or literature you were allowed to listen to in this era, but you've changed your mind. We may have yes. to talk about that later. Uh, but you want to just set people up real quick, cultural revolution. What are, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so, um, you know, the PRC is founded in 1949. The communists take over the entire country except for the island of Taiwan, which is, uh, you know, it's not clear what that island's status is. Um, and the communists uh, establish a pretty harsh dictatorship in the PRC and increasingly things get worse from 1956 1957 on uh the 1960s you have the 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 great proletariat cultural revolution and uh that is pretty nasty lots of lots of People just get accused of doing random things, uh, of being of, anti-revolutionary. Yeah, exactly. And it, it it becomes sort of not so much uh, an ideological thing as just a way to get back at your neighbors using ideology. Yeah. Um. And things are really bad. Uh. You know, everybody looks back on this period pretty much and says, "Yeah, it's really nothing good about that period." Uh. In the PRC today. People look back on that period either with embarrassment or you can do it like the government does, which they kind of look away. Or they will acknowledge that it was really rough, but it wasn't Mao's fault. That was his wife Jiang Qing's fault. Yeah, there's there's a, a million ways to kind of justify it uh, if you're the, the CCP, but all of them are kind of empty. Right. Um, so almost literally nothing is written or composed for mass circulation during this the sixty six to seventy six period of the that's cultural not revolution, quite true. There is some stuff that's composed from. I said Mexico. almost nothing, yeah. but th- there are, there are, for example, eight model operas that you're allowed to listen to and watch. And you should know that those eight model operas are the only things, the only kind of literature that people can consume during this period. To the point where even today, even though these are horrible, horrible operas, mm-hmm. and they're not horrible, they're just kind of sappy and and. Very it's propaganda. Pro- propaganda, yeah. yeah. Um, they still, you know, when you when there was an art exhibit here at the University of Oregon, hmm. you had women who grew up during that period, kind of like seeing propaganda posters of this specific opera and just randomly breaking out in song between the Red each Detachment other. of Women by Zhang <laughs> Qing, who and I we we, we watched a, a couple of interviews about uh, about this opera. It, it is part of a seminar I was in. And one of the people being interviewed was a writer, a very well-known writer mm-hmm. later on, who wrote like some pretty great stuff. And he kind of had this bemused smile. They were asking him about the opera. And he's like, well, wasn't a lot to watch in those days. And this was, you could see it on TV and lots of nice looking ladies wearing very short shorts. It was kind of cool, actually. <laughs> like, is, is this Yuhua? I could be. Okay. I don't remember who it was anymore. Because that um, kind of sounds like something Yuhua would say. It does kind of sound like something Yuhua <laughs> would say. So I, I want to I segue into our, into our picks here. Uh by asking you in a, in a previous version of this podcast, if we actually actually lost the file, Rob completely I lost just, it. Just dropped it into the the I don't the know what toilet. I did, the toilet. The <laughs> toilet. Um, anyway, 
The digital toilet. The digital toilet. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, um, your original pick was Zhang Qing in this period, yeah. uh, but you've changed your mind. Why did you change? Your, I mean, I can think of aesthetically why you would. That's an easy one. Why you would change your mind, but. So I, the 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 writer that I'm picking is Huan Chun Ming, who is a Taiwanese writer who does kind of Taiwanese nativist literature, um, and we'll get into him in the second in a second. But to answer your question, I think that uh, when we originally conceived of this project, I was thinking of it in terms of China equals PRC, which I you know like is is a uh, problematic already, um, but. Uh, as I, I thank you for for dumping that into the digital toilet because it, <laughs> right? it forced me to rethink what I wanted to do with this project, what we were doing with this project, and I was like, you know what, we're the Chinese literature podcast, not the literature from China or literature from the PRC podcast. So you know, we need to be incorporating more works from Hong Kong and more works from Taiwan, more works from. Malaysian speaking Chinese communities, all that kind of stuff. We've sort of done that, but not as uh, well as I think we should. So that was why I changed over. I, I mean, also just to point out, I think that the writers in Taiwan in the 1960s and 1970s and, and on are in a lot of ways much better than the writing that's going on, particularly at this time. Um, so I, I think it you know, once I kind of rethought about it in my head, it was a very easy choice to jump and go like, oh, you know, last week, I did Bai Xian Yong, and this week I'm doing uh, Huang Chunming, both writers who grew up in Taiwan. Uh, you know, they're just so much better than anything that's being produced in the 1960s or the 1970s in, in the PRC. Of course, you you know, I'm going to disagree with that in a second because my writer, but to be fair, though, my writer is very much below ground for most of this period. Uh, so in that sense, neither of us is choosing a a writer that a a regular Chinese Joe Z H O U would have encountered in this period. You would have been unlikely to have heard, heard of either of them. So it's kind of a funny it's kind of a funny discussion because if we're talking about definitive writers, what do they define? Right? They don't define the era because no one read them and they weren't allowed to be circulated and they had to be elsewhere. Right? Um, but one of the difficulties in this period is is taking seriously stuff that is being circulated on despite the fact that it's crap so rob i think this is a good point to actually get into the weeds about the writers that we're looking at so i'm looking at huang huang chun ming uh huang chun ming is a taiwanese nativist writer he's part of a a a larger movement uh in taiwan where they're kind of trying to to get back to Taiwanese-ness um, and questions of Taiwan. So as I mentioned early on in this podcast, um, Taiwan was the only part of of the the sort of China sphere. I don't know what how do we how do we talk about this without without stepping on some political landmines. Uh, there's a completely non-communist dictatorship that exists in Taiwan from 1945 all the way into the 1980s, uh, when the dictatorship starts to to fall apart, sort of. Um, and you had a lot more liberty of what you could write about, and. Um, Taiwan had been colonized by Japan from 1895 to 1945, and then uh, you had these people who were fleeing the the Civil War on in mainland China and occupying Taiwan. And they essentially said, you Taiwanese people, we're going to force you to be Chinese. And that identity was foisted upon them, whether or not that is... You know whether or not they are Chinese. That's not really the issue we're we're taking up. But what is interesting is by the 1970s, you have some some nativist Taiwanese folks like Huan Chunming who are starting to push back against this identity that's being imposed above uh, from above onto them that they have to be Chinese. And so Huang Chunming is writing stories like the drowning of a uh, an old cat. Um, which is a Taiwanese story about a an old guy who resists the uh, the the sort of drive for development that that Taiwan is seeing in the 1970s, and he uh, he eventually commits suicide. And uh, old cat is actually, I believe, a reference in in, in Taiwanese slang to 
old man. Like I, I don't, I don't speak much Hoklo, the Taiwanese language, but that is my understanding of of kind of what that reference is. So you start to see these Taiwanese writers, unlike Bai Xianyong who uh, was my choice for last week. He was born in Guangxi in Guilin, I believe. So he is the son of a KMT general who flees China for Taiwan. Bai Xianyong is very much part of this pro-China group in Taiwan. In the 1970s, you witness in in Taiwan, you witness this rise of this Taiwanese consciousness and this sort of... Uh, advocacy for more Taiwanese elements in literature. And that's really what Huan, Huan Chunming is. And Huan Chunming has a lot of different uh, short stories. I, he, he wrote uh, Sayonara Zaijian, which is a story about a, a Taiwanese guy who has to find hookers for a bunch of uh, Japanese businessmen who his company is working for. And there's this sense of like he's complicit even in, in trying to help and and uh, help him feed himself and feed his family uh, and, you know, have a kind of middle class job. He's got to sell Taiwanese women to the former colonizer. It's a re- it's a real laugh fest. You'll you'll <laughs> he, enjoy. He it. does. Huang Chunming is interesting because he does a lot of tragedy. Like I don't, I can't recall any story that he wrote that I've read that is a that has a happy ending. They're all really really bad. Well, to be, well, to be fair, there's not a lot in the '70s to write about that's happy if you're in China and Chinese and you're not writing for the party, right? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly true in mainland China. In in Taiwan, you're a bit freer, but. Even then, it's kind of hard to see happy endings in in literature. Yeah, that is that is true, actually. And it, you and you and I have talked a lot because we, we both write uh, fiction as well. Um, Try it's published yet? It totally will be. We'll, we'll win. Then we'll each win a Pulitzer at some point. It's just a matter of time. Can they name uh, us both in the same Nobel Prize? That's a good point because we have the same last name. That could be an easy. <laughs> they could just a two for one there. Um, it's very hard to write great art. That's happy. And and I think that's part of the problem with uh, China in the 1960s and 1970s is because China is a perfect society at the time, all writing has to have happy endings if it's talking about the present. So you, you essentially can't write about the present. And that's one of the reasons I like to turn to Taiwan um, at this in the 1960s is because you actually have some really great writers who are talking about interesting things. And Huang Chunming is just one example of a bunch of uh, Taiwanese uh, writers. I, I'm thinking particularly of Wang Jun Ho, who is another uh, writer who I was thinking of doing for this decade. You you really do have some interesting stuff going on at, at this time in Taiwan that's not interesting only because it's from Taiwan and the stuff that's being produced in the PRC is crap, but it's actually interesting on its own terms. So the, the thing, thing about happy endings is interesting because uh, the writer that I'm choosing is the great poet Mang Ke. Um, when I first encountered the poetry of uh, what's commonly called the Misty School, the Meng Long Shi, which is China's first real underground poetry movement, at least that we know of. I mean, there may be others, but they were never published, so who knows, right? Um, when I first encountered them, Bei Dao, who's the most famous member of this group, was positioned as very, very political. I remember reading it and going, I don't see why this is political. I don't get it, right? But it's amazing how political you can be perceived simply by not writing happy poems. If you write a sad poem in an era when you're only allowed to write happy poems, that's a statement. The other thing that was a statement for this school of poets is writing poems that are hard to decipher. Because if you're making people think, and they may not even figure out exactly what you're saying, having something murky, misty, muddy, and not having a clear message is not good communist poetry. One of the things uh, that Mao stated poetry and writing should have to do in his Yan'an talks in the 1940s, right, Rob? Um, is that it has to be clear enough so that some uh, Bufu peasant can understand what you're talking about. It has to be direct. It has to be to the point. And that's one of the reasons that so much that's written by communists is crap. 
Yeah, and so just a quick history thing: the, all the most of the writers in this movement either served in the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, uh, or were were at least involved in some form of labor or work. Uh, they all went to school. Some of them dropped out. Um, Beidao and Mangke start self-publishing a poetry journal called today Jin Tian, which is now legendary. Didn't last that long. It, didn't last, only lasted a couple of years. They nailed the first issue to a bulletin board and didn't um, kind of circulate as Zamenstadt? Kind of. Yeah, it was very much underground. And this is one of the things, one of the reasons that pretty much all of the, the writers that I read from this era are poets in China is because poetry was one of the only things you could really hope to circulate among a bunch of people easily. You can't circulate it's a hard novel to make photocopies easily. of a novel or, or hand no, copies of no. a novel as they were doing. But one of the guys in the group actually had access to a mimeograph machine, and so they were able to run off some copies well, of this. You mentioned in this period. What period is this? I know we're talking about the 1970s. Right, 76. 76, so it's after yeah. Mao died. And, yeah, it's after Mao and, died. Uh, Zhang Qing was kind of overthrown at this point. So yeah, things yeah. are kind of up in the air as to where China is headed. Right. But there is a period, that this, there's this... this breathing space where Mao's gone and no one really knows what's going to happen next. Deng Xiaoping eventually takes over. All anyone really knows is Mao's gone. But at this time, Deng Xiaoping was still down in the south feeding slop to the pigs, wasn't he? But he comes up pretty quick. By 78, he's he's the dude. He's in charge. Um, But what makes this poetry so fascinating, especially in this, just these first few years after Mao dies, is that it, it takes a lot of the same images that communist poetry was taking, but then just turns them inside out or plays with them. So this is one of Monka's poems. This is a translation by Lucas Klein, who's a colleague and friend and and translator extraordinaire. He's translated everybody. He's actually it's been just on called, a podcast. That's true. A couple yeah. of years ago, he was. That was one of our not good sound most quality of, podcasts. Mostly from most, our end, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, for sure. But so apologies, Lucas. Anyway, he's, he's got a translation, a whole book of Monko translations called the October Dedications, which is worth a read. Anyway, this is from the poem Sunlight, and here it goes. Sunlight grows on the earth. It takes the face of day and pushes up through the ground with its stalk. And those bones that also have pushed soil off their selves, first they look at the sky overhead with their rolling empty eye sockets, then look around at the crowding flora, then rush crawling back to wherever each longs for. Sunlight grows over on the earth. Sunlight, and amidst it, a horde of people recently escaped from darkness. Now, Rob, uh, sunlight, that's a reference to Mao, isn't it? Yes, so in Or in the goodly. 1960s, 1970s, all references to the sun were actually references to Mao, in the same yeah, way that and there's, poetry in the West, you, all references to flowers is a, a reference to to poetry. Yeah. So very, very common image. And this in Manka uses the sun or sunlight a lot. And it's almost always in a reverse way. There's another poem and I can't quote the line off the top of my head, but it describes a horse cart pulling the sun as a, and I think it's even a uh, yoked to the, the ox cart, something like that. Uh, the idea being it's a complete reversal. It isn't the sun giving light to the people and all that they need. It's, the sun is so weak, it's actually being pulled along by an ox, right? So it's also kind of funny. Uh, not ha-ha, break out loud laughing, <laughs> you and I love Ghostbusters, funny. But um, but when you're, when you're in that kind of context, it is kind of funny, right? There's no way someone misses that reference. They go, whoa, what is he you, doing with the sun? That's but you weird. really have to be kind of in that, in, in that kind of sphere to get the— Right. Or, I mean, you can, we can get the joke and we can explain it, but we can't understand how funny it is. Right. Right, but what's this is one of the reasons I picked Manke over Beidao, who's the most famous of the group, is that there is this element of humor, of sort of puckishness about Manke that Beidao doesn't have, I don't think. Manke, the name Manke, of course, is a pen name, and it was given him by Beidao, and it was an English, was meant to be like kind of a, a transliteration of the word monkey, the English word monkey, because <laughs> that was how was he was Was that a reference to, well. to Shioji Ji? And, no? No, okay. no, it's just because he happened to be, Manke happens to also be frankly, just kind of funny, and, and everyone thought so, and they called him Monkey. Anyway, uh, but as a marker of, of what it was like writing poetry, they Beidao was, of course, a pen name also. He and Manko both took pen names because it was still very dangerous. You could get 
you could get thrown in the slammer for writing the poem I just read, which is weird for people who haven't studied this period, but it was just serious business. Um, this poetry holds up well. Nothing else in the area holds up except as a historical artifact, but this underground stuff is still very, very interesting Rob, to read. can I ask you, because you're saying poetry from, this poetry is the only thing from this era that holds up well. Is this really from the the era that you're talking about? I mean, the the late 1970s after Mal dies, I mean, things are kind of starting to be a free-for-all and the good stuff happens all over. Well, except I'll jump in here and say that a lot of the stuff that gets put into collections first, these guys wrote in the early 70s. So Munka and Beidou were actually writing in the early 70s? Early to mid-70s, huh. yeah. So there, if there's, I have a whole book called Scar Literature. This is what some of this stuff is also called. And some of these, a lot of these poems are dated, and some of them are dated as, as, as early as like 68, 69. So they're just kind of stuffing this poetry under their mattress and just not sharing oh, yeah. it with the... Yeah, you're not going to circulate yeah. it in the 60s. Are you kidding? No way. Uh, but as things start to open up, they go, well, I mean, why not, right? We'll just nail it to this bulletin board. We'll have pen names. No one's going to know who Martin we are. And let's just see what... Yeah, exactly. Um, both go on to have great careers. Uh, and, you know, we get to talk about the 1980s next, which is going to be really exciting because we love the 1980s. The both hair. of us do. <laughs> well, actually, that's true everywhere. You know, that you, I was about to say, well, in the U.S. It's like, no, no, in China as well. There was, there was some pretty killer hair in the 80s. Um, but the late 70s are special because this is this is real explosion of dissident literature that is more than just let's get rid of the party it's something unique it's artistically unique um, i want to say that about taiwanese literature as well in this period it's it's uh really the blossoming of taiwanese literature because in the 1950s the the dictatorship on taiwan kind of shut down most literary uh production to the point where you pretty much had to write propaganda or otherwise it wouldn't get published and you could get thrown in jail. But in the 1960s, you start to see some of that bubbling up, some real literature bubbling up. The 1970s witnesses a, a revival, much like the PRC does in the late 1970s. So it's interesting how these two societies, both of which, you know, Chinese is the main language, how they kind of mirror each other. They, they kind of do. And... For me, and this is going to be one of my final thoughts here, but one of the things that makes the 1980s so interesting for art and literature is a lot of these underground, dissident, sort of uh, borderland kinds of ideas and writings come to dominate uh, Chinese arts and letters in the 80s. Uh, What was once underground becomes above ground. It's their early 90s grunge moment where underground punk bands become the bands that all the big labels want to sign, that kind of thing. Um, And of course, in the process, just like in the 90s, pretty much change how people read stuff and listen to stuff. I think that's a pretty good place to end it. So we should be thinking about Meng Ke as sort of a 1970s Chinese Kurt Cobain? That's that's how I'm going to see him. Not as sad, but... (laughs) And he's still alive. He hasn't... And he's still alive. That's another huge difference, yes. yes. All right. That's a great place to end it. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.